My name is Jason. And my name is David. And this is Discern Realities, a Dungeon World podcast. Okay, listeners, we are back with Dungeon World Basics, Episode 6. Today we are beginning the GM topics. We're going to start with this episode on GM agenda and principles, and next week we will be doing GM moves. I should tell you, listeners, that we're going to be a little bit more casual, a little more conversational during the GM basics, because, I don't know, just because it it feels good, it feels right. (laughs) (laughs) So, David, in the book, the very first part of the GM section is called how to GM. And it's a page long, this little introduction for how to GM. (laughs) It is refreshingly light, uh, just a single page where we are told that the GM is to describe the situation, follow the rules, make moves and exploit their prep. And that's kind of basically it, right? Yep. That's what you do as a GM in Dungeon World. There is not a whole lot else that you need to know. We'll just end the episode right now. I think that's probably the right move. Yeah, I, I've, <laughs> I've got a lot to do today. So no, I mean, obviously, there's a lot more to it than that. But I actually do think there's something to be said about that sort of like very basic, uh, almost like simple reduction of like, what is, you know, what is GMing this, right? It's, because, it's very much a, a keep it simple, stupid kind of thing, you know? Absolutely. Uh, and there's a lot of wisdom in it, though, right? Because To my mind, I think it's really easy to overdo Dungeon World prep. What do you think about that? Or like Dungeon World GMing? Like it's way easy. I mean, it's easy to over prep for anything that you feel like you're supposed to have done more than uh, than, than you have been told to do. So the book helpfully tells you right here, this is all you have to do. But if you're coming from other games and other systems, you may think that you need to do a whole lot more. You know, one of the things when I first started running Dungeon World that I had to kind of shake free from was this idea that my prep was the main thing happening, right? Like the stuff that I had prepared, that was the story. And I think that getting out of that mindset was a big, big part of learning how to run Dungeon World for me. And also, if you look at the tools that we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks, the GM, uh, the GM side tools in Dungeon World. I think if you're coming from a more traditional role playing game background, it's really easy to overestimate like what's going on or to be intimidated by it. And and ultimately, like I think running Dungeon World is actually pretty simple. It's so conversational, you know. I think that's right. You're just doing these basic things where you you follow the rules, you follow your agenda and what that entails, and you exploit your prep, but your prep is not the only thing that they're – it's not the be-all, end-all. Yeah, absolutely. So like before we leave this like one page in the book, this How to GM Dungeon World page, there are a couple of really like key points in there, I think. One is that the book says that after you describe the situation, which is if you're a GM coming off of any role-playing game, you, you know what that is, right? You know what it means to describe the situation. That's your job. It says after you describe the situation, then ask the players, what do you do? That's really powerful, right? Yeah, I mean, that is the that is the verbal cue that, like, now it is your turn to talk, and that's how you're facilitating the conversation of the game. Always do that whenever you're trying to pass that, that baton. What do you do? Invite the players to react. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I think it's even important to go one step further than the book does and say, in my experience at least, I think it's more – I think it's important to go one step further and say – not just what do you all do, but rather ask a specific player, what do you do? That really, really like sharpens the conversation and keeps everything on track and prevents it from being kind of a, either a sort of like meandering, uh, <laughs> sort of malaise of a conversation or, uh, or everyone jumping in all at once, right? Right. The book addresses it again when you get to the moves section where it says, and then after you make a move, always ask, what do you do? So, I think I think you're right. Like it does intend that you kind of direct this question to a particular player, though it does not say so in so many words. It works well in practice. Another thing that this one page thing points out is after it says follow the rules, it goes a little deeper and it says what you're really doing is listening for move triggers. 
And if it's unclear if a move fired off or not, you should clarify that with the players. And I think that's like a major job of the GM, particularly the basic moves. I think the GM should always be looking and, and ever listening for those triggers to fire off, right? Like let the players just kind of be in the conversation and be in their description and you kind of jump in and say, oh, it sounds like you're doing defy danger. Or if you're not, sh- or if you're not sure, ask, are you trying to defy danger here? Yeah. You can get familiar with the basic moves pretty quick, but it's always helpful to to ask for clarification, especially if you think that the player sounds like they're angling towards something on their playbook. Because even to this day, I don't have every playbook move memorized with all their triggers. So it's helpful to ask the player, are you trying to trigger some move on your playbook now? And let them tell you. Yeah, absolutely. I sometimes even say, Okay, go ahead and do Defy Danger unless you have a better playbook move. I sometimes say that too because, yeah, I don't have them all memorized, right? <laughs> yeah, there's no way. Awesome. Well, that's that one page, How to GM. Let's go to uh, Agenda and Principles next. We'll start with Agenda. So according to Dungeon World, your agenda is the list of things you aim to do at all times when GMing Dungeon World. And those three things are portray a fantastic world – Fill the characters' lives with adventure and play to find out what happens. Let's just take them in order. Portray a fantastic world. That seems pretty obvious, right? Yeah, you're playing a a sword and sorcery fantasy game. If you're in a real boring place that has no fantasy at all to it, you know, unless your players really signed up for that for some particular reason, you may want to think about adding some fantasy. (laughs) Right, right. I think sometimes, like, there's a tendency to, like, get mired in details right like in boring details and so like when i hear portray a fantastic world i i almost take that as instruction to ignore very mundane things right like i don't care about shopping for gear right that's really mundane and and i i prefer to just kind of get that done get it out of the way quickly and focus on like the really cool shit the really big you know wild fantastic stuff yeah, I mean, if your tavern doesn't have uh, turtles walking around that are the de facto service trays, <laughs> you're, you're just you're missing out. <laughs> indeed, indeed. David's joking, by the way, listeners. Um. <laughs> every tavern, every tavern. <laughs> Fill the characters' lives with adventure. I think that actually goes better to the point that I just made. Focus on the fun, adventurous stuff, not the boring stuff, you know? Yeah, I think the more that you can limit the time spent on on the boring activities and maximize the time spent on the adventure, the more fun you're going to have and the more fun your players are going to have. Of course, you're going to have to have downtime scenes. You know, there are specific moves about them and, and let those scenes happen and then try and wrap them up and get back to the adventure. Well, to be fair, like, I think that those downtime scenes, like making camp and all that stuff, that actually can be really fun, right? I think that's the sort of, if we're looking at, like, adventure as a sort of yin and yang process, I think that's the sort of, like, one half of it, right? Like, the the build up to the adventure part. What I think is, like, really bad is, for example, this is a little bit of a deeper dive than what I think we're probably called for here, but, like, I I like to start, for example, I like to start a session in the middle of an adventure. I like to start in Medias Res. I like to get things going rather than have them do the classic, in D&D at least, the classic like you all meet at a tavern and someone gives you a job, right? Like that's to me, like that's just such a boring part of the of the sort of like D&D trope, right? That can be a thing that happened, but we don't need to see it on screen. So. Play to find out what happens. I think this is the most interesting of the agendas, personally. What do you think about this? Play to find out what happens. I would agree. This is this is much more the secret sauce or the killer app that Dungeon World is doing that some other things are not doing. And it goes back to what we were talking about, about exploiting your prep and not making your prep be the only thing that happens. Because you are playing to find out what happens just like all the rest of the players are, too. I know right now that you're running an adventure using a module called The Cold Ruins of Last Life. And I know one of the things that, looking at your chatter and stuff on our Slack group, David, one of the things that you've been really excited about is this sort of very emergent kind of story that's been coming out that no one could plan for. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. It takes some of the things that Dungeon World does and cranks them up to 11 by rewriting some of the core rules. But... We'll talk about that 
someplace besides here. But let me tell you, it is so much more fun to play to find out what happens instead of like trying to force everyone onto what I think is supposed to happen at every twist and turn. Yeah. And I think something that's worth pointing out here, you know, when we're looking at the agendas, I think what's almost like more important when we're examining the GM agendas, what's more important than like what you should be doing is what you should not be doing. For example, you know, you are not trying to quote, beat the players. You're not trying to make them solve puzzles and traps like in real life, right? You are not trying to kill them, <laughs> right? Like, I think there's some some dungeon masters in D&D who are like kind of pride themselves on their ability to kill the player characters. And, and that's just not in the spirit of this game. Like that's not like filling their lives with adventure. That's just being sadistic, right? Or another thing you should not be doing is running the player characters through your carefully constructed story, right? So I think it's almost the agendas to me, I view them as like things. I, I look at them in the opposite things I should not be doing. Yeah. I think that play to find out what happens implies that you are not putting them through a carefully constructed story. Filling their lives with adventure implies that you are not trying to kill them or beat them. You are just trying to fill their lives with adventure. Now, obviously that can be very dangerous adventure depending on their choices. It may mean that they are running headlong into a dangerous situation where they could die, but it should not be like your goal or your predetermined outcome. Absolutely. So let's move on to principles. This is a bigger list. The principles, according to the book, are your guides. When you're getting ready to do something significant in the game, make sure that whatever you're doing fits with the principles and then fire away. The principles, you want to read them off? Yeah. Draw maps, leave blanks. Address the characters, not the players. Embrace the fantastic. Make a move that follows. Never speak the name of your move. Give every monster life. Name every person, ask questions and use the answers, be a fan of the characters, think dangerous, begin and end with the fiction, and finally, think off screen too. I don't think we have to talk about all of these. The book does a pretty good job of explaining what they each mean, but I do think there are a few that we should probably highlight. I'd like to start with draw maps, leave blanks. This is something that I used to do a lot when I first started running dungeon world. I, I don't really use maps as much anymore um, because the types of adventures I run now aren't really like map focused. But when I would do maps, or especially early in the early days when I was running it, I would do that. I would maybe make like a seven room dungeon and I'd put stuff in four of the rooms and leave three blank. And leaving those rooms blank that is that goes hand in hand with the agenda of play to find out what happens, right? Your characters, or your players rather, as you're having the conversation at the table, as you're discussing what's going on in the story, they're going to come up with ideas that you maybe didn't anticipate. And so if you have blanks on your dungeon map, you can kind of pepper those unforeseen things in there, right? Yeah, and I mean, I'm about to be drawing a map, but it's not a dungeon map, it's a world map. And there are regions and things that the players have already found and there's other that others that they've seen in the distance but you know there's gonna be a lot of gray area between all of this it's not just like it's not like a, a, a completely defined map but it's gonna have areas that it's like yeah you know this is kind of over here and that's kind of over there but there's lots of lots of space in between so that's another way to think about the draw maps and leaving blanks what about address the characters, not the players? I find this to be very powerful. This is something you do in all Powered by the Apocalypse games. And it's unbelievably powerful as a habit that you do at the table, right? Yeah, I mean, I think you should be doing this in, in any kind of role playing. Um, but the fact that it like reminds you to do it here is helpful. Yeah, I mean, because what happens is when you talk to a player and you always refer to them by their character name, you're just helping create that little extra bit of immersion. And it's gotten to the point for me as a player where I, I find it very disruptive or very almost jarring, right? When a GM in any game, not just a power by the backless game in any game refers to me by my player name. Like it just totally takes me out of the situation at this point. It's a bit, but again, it's something I never really thought to do until I started playing dungeon world, you know? Yeah. I mean, and that can be, that can be helpful for a variety of reasons. Like if you need to 
get somebody's attention all, all of a sudden or, or address something specifically like that's not cool. Like, and you can switch to their player name and not their character name and, and, right, yeah. and sort that out quicker as opposed to like any confusion about it. Well, it doesn't even have to be for like castigation purposes, right? Like, no, it, it, it could be like a safety tool thing. Like, yeah, absolutely. Or, or you just want to talk about something as players, right? Like you, you're talking about like, you know, maybe you're talking about things that the characters don't know about, right? You're talking about out of character stuff. That's, that's an appropriate time to call the player by their player name. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a good time too. And, and, and I think I'll address that a little bit more when we talk about think off screen. Let's see which others of these sound like something we want to talk about. How about make a move that follows? What does that mean to you? Make a move that follows. I mean, that means like, well, we haven't talked about moves yet, but when GM we talk, moves, that is, yeah, yeah. When we talk about GM moves, these these would be looking for the right GM move that would follow in the fiction of like the con- the, the consequences put in terms of a GM move of whatever the player character just did. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, to me, I read this as just to be very honest, right? That's something we've talked about during this entire basic series. You know, we're having a conversation at the table and that conversation for it to work as a medium by which we play the game and tell the story, we have to all be very honest, right? When you're talking about a game that uses fictional positioning as a very powerful tool at the table, rather than like objective numbers, honesty and truth is majorly important there. And I think, I think that's what that means. Like do a GM move that is an honest result, an honest outcome. How about never speak the name of your move? That's an immersion thing to me. Yeah, I think that's an immersion thing on the GM side of things, where this is very specifically don't speak the name of your move, the GM move. When you're asking the player if they are doing thus, um, it's helpful if you say the name of the move that you think they are doing. So don't t- don't take this as a prohibition against that. <laughs> right, exactly. Give every monster life. I can't say I think about this one much, but I think that's because I, I, I so easily slip into this sort of like characterization aspects of running a game. I've never thought about it in these terms. But what do you what do you think about give every monster life? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that you you do that. Oh, oh yeah, I know I do it, but I just <laughs> I don't think about it in those terms, right? Like, oh, I better give this monster life. Like, you know? I I do think about it because I try and whenever like my players are encountering a new creature or faction of creatures. I try and think about what the motivating factors are, why the monsters are doing what they're doing. And oftentimes that leads to different kinds of consequences of like deciding to engage in combat with them or trying to parlay with them because they've got an agenda of their own. And so that's the life to me that the monsters have. And and I give all of them that life. And sometimes, you know, within the faction, there's quirks, you know? Not every monster is, like, on the same page. Like, not every orc is like, oh, yeah, we all do this thing. But they have sometimes individual motivations that give them life beyond their faction motivations. Yeah, absolutely. Name every person. That's a good one. That's a hard one, too. It's really (laughs) hard. I tend to forget this one a lot. I try not to, but sometimes I'm in a hurry and I don't give a shit about naming the barkeep right <laughs> but do you think there's like an advantage to doing it like is this is this a, is this for real advice like should you name every person well this is probably a little bit more advanced than the basics but i can tell you how i name a lot of my characters and how it gives them life and helps me keep up with them oh i can't wait to hear it what is this i name them after characters in books oh yeah you do that yeah and yeah. uh and i will I will adopt either the motivations or the foil motivations of the character in the book. So it's easy to remember. Like if I'm familiar with the character in the book and I give them either those, those person's general motivations or like the opposite of that person's motivations, then like I can keep up with it. I can remember their name. And like, if they have relationships with other people in in the book, then like I might name another NPC that and adopt it kind of to this situation. That's pretty cool. Well, and also, like, I think by doing it that way, you're also kind of using the good work of the author of that book, right? Because presumably that author has thought about consistency of their world and like all the names and things making sense together. That's one of the things I was going to say. When I, I, I do try to name as many characters as the, as I can. And I try to name as many places as I can. When I do naming, when I do, when I am naming things, I try to really focus on making sure those names sound right for each other. One of the things that I personally dislike, and I, this is a bit of an advanced topic, but one of the things I personally dislike when I'm in a game is when I meet characters from the same 
town or village or community, and their names don't sound linguistically similar. <laughs> it just bugs the bugs the shit out of me so much. And but there are ways you can kind of get around this. Like I like to use. There's a resource called the Story Game Names Book, which is very popular in our community, and that has like lots of different names by different real world and fantasy cultures. And I love those because like those are just lists of names that all are made to work together and sound great together. That's super helpful. I think that's actually a PDF resource that is available to everyone online. So yeah, it's free. Yeah. If you aren't doing it, it's worth checking out. How about ask questions and use the answers? This is pretty powerful too. Yeah, this is part of the joy and the fun of playing to find out what happens and leaving blanks on your map because you're going to come back and fill those in later. What you're going to find out how it happens because you're going to ask your players, how how does this happen? Or what do you think about this area of the world or that creature? What does it look like? And then use it. Sometimes it's just color and like it's the description, but repeat the description like the next time they see that monster or that place. If it's substantive, find a way to incorporate it and your your players will love it. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that you don't even have to be like a genius GM here or anything, right? Like you don't have to, the questions that you pose can come from another source, right? So for example, one of the things that you and I are very fond of, David, are the dungeon starters uh, that were popularized by game designer Marshall Miller originally. And what I love about those little dungeon world dungeon starters is they contain little packets of questions that you can pose to the players to help fill out the world, right? And once you do that, once you use those enough, you start to get better yourself as a GM of like coming up with questions that help you explore the setting, explore the themes, explore the various NPCs, the, the various motivations of the party, all that stuff. And going back to the principle we were just talking about, the name of every person it's not fun for your players if you just ask them to name the people and then you use that as your answers. You can do that, but I would strongly encourage you to give them more than just naming the NPCs. That is, yeah, that is definitely not deep enough. Um, I think you could ask the you could ask the players like rich questions, right? Why are you all going on this adventure? What treasure do you expect to find here? What dangers are in this land? That kind of thing. Why did the Duke of Farfinell? supposedly murder his wife, right? Like you can ask the players those questions and and maybe, you know, they, they give you answers, you know, whenever they're ready. Maybe you take a break, let them think about it. And you don't necessarily have to like work all that stuff in right away, but you just note it and then work it in later, right? Like session two, session three, session four. You're going to look like a genius. Be a fan of the characters. This is probably the most important principle that you think. I mean, I guess it depends on how you think about the principles, but it's a very important principle. And I think it's it goes, an important concept, right? It goes hand in hand with the agenda of fill the characters' lives with adventure. You should be doing that. And meanwhile, you should be a fan of the characters so that you are not doing the things that we said you shouldn't do, like trying to kill them or... <laughs> Or not have not portraying a fantastic world, things like that. Well, what does it mean to you? Like, be a fan of the characters. Like, this is something that Kate and I talked about on one of our other shows, right? We talked about this question, like, what does it mean to be a fan of the characters? Like, what, do you, what does it mean to you to be a fan of the characters? If I'm a fan of something, I want I want to watch them have a good experience. Like, if I'm a fan of, like, a sports team, I want to see them in a good game. I don't want to see them in a boring game. I, I kind of probably want to see them win. Uh, whatever winning means, you know, in sports, there's very obvious what it means to win. What it means for your characters to win might mean very different things. And if here's a big important thing. If I'm a fan of, of a team and that team is going to lose, I want them to like have a movie epic losing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good analogy. I, I, my, my, my view is the same. I think that being a fan of the characters doesn't mean they automatically win. It doesn't mean they're always heroic. It means they have trials and tribulations, right? It means they – you put dangers in front of them and you give them a chance to defeat those dangers. And even if they don't defeat the dangers, maybe indeed they suffer greatly. They lose a lot. You make the losing interesting, right? Make make the pain an opportunity to show what that character is about. That's being a fan of the characters, I think. Why don't we skip ahead to think off screen too? I know you wanted to talk about that. Yeah. So, so I mentioned that when we're addressing the characters, not the players, occasionally there will be times when you want to address the players and thinking off screen. Sometimes you think silently off screen. That's why it's thinking it's in your head, but sometimes it's helpful to 
tell your players, not their characters, what is happening somewhere far away. And I know you do this, and I learned this from you a long time ago, where you'll say something like, though it is entirely beyond your perception, and you mean the characters, not the players. And then you describe the scene to the players of something far away, some where something dangerous is happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of a personal technique of mine, for sure. I don't, I don't actually know like what Dungeon World would have you do in the text, but I think it's in the spirit of it. I mean, I definitely like to, but because my my style of running a table is to have it be a little bit more like a writer's room, a little bit more just a just a slight extra layer of like meta conversation. I don't mind doing this sort of like scene that's not within the player character's knowledge, right? Uh, and it's something the players get to see and enjoy, but the characters don't know about it. And so I, I don't mind doing that. I think that adds a lot of drama, makes it feel very cinematic. I think even if you don't do that, though, I think what this principle is telling you is just to be mindful of the bigger world. Right. Mine was just a more specific example of how you could use a move. We haven't talked about the moves yet, but you could use a move to be thinking off screen and showing your players things yeah. and not their characters. And we will talk about GM moves next week for sure. Is there anything else you want to say about principles and agendas? I don't think so. Um, I think we've done a, a, a good job of kind of saying our, our thoughts about them. And I think it's going to – this combined with our talk about moves on the next episode I think is going to hopefully make it – easy for new GMs to understand what the pages of this rule book are talking about. Yeah. And listeners, I'll just say that we've done a pretty, not completely light touch here, but we've, we've kind of just gone through things a little quickly here. If you want a really nice, deep discussion about principles and agenda, and agendas, like if you want to go that like extra deep level, I strongly recommend the agenda and principles episode of our other show plus one forward, uh, rich and rich, like really go in on like, on like this sort of a lot of the theory underpinning these. And it's a great listen. Uh, we'll include a link in the notes. Let's go to the actual play. Hello, listeners. I have a couple of things I want to tell you about. The first is that GauntletCon 2018 is coming October 18th through the 21st. GauntletCon is an online convention featuring games, panels, and contests. The event is free for our Patreon supporters, but no fears if you're not a Patreon supporter. There will be a registration process available soon for non-Patreon folks. Uh, please note, however, that Gauntlet Patreon supporters are allowed to register for game events before everybody else. The second thing I want to tell you about is Codex Chrome 2, the newest issue of our fantastic indie RPG zine. It features Veil 2020, a slimmed-down retro-future version of the popular game The Veil, designed to be played with old Cyberpunk 2020 and Shadowrun Adventures, Full Throttle, a rule supplement and starter scenario for the Outlaw Biker Gang game One Percenter, Body Hack, a one-player journaling game by Akira McGran about learning to live with your new cybernetic body part, and three dozen cyberware glitches and malfunctions. To get Codex Chrome 2, just make a $4 or higher pledge on our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet by the end of July. And back issues, as always, are available on DriveThruRPG. Thanks. All right. We are continuing the story of Lucero Castafiel. When we last saw Lucero, he had just defeated a massive serpent called the Starlight Serpent. And I don't think we actually revealed his name on the show, but <laughs> that's what he's called. Out of character, David, he's called the Starlight Serpent. And he found his sister, Urbina. A few things worth pointing out that I think are good context for this. We described this in the first episode of Basics, but... The Castafiels, particularly the Castafiel women, are subject to a sort of genetic vampirism so that when they die, they they become vampires. That's something we talked about briefly. And so that might be something that's going on here. She might be a vampire. And we know in this present scene that she is, for lack of a better way of putting it, sort of hooked up <laughs> to some kind of system where – sort of vein-like tubes are connected all over her body and a sort of black ichor is being pumped out of her into this complex of people, corpses. Uh, they're not really corpses, though, because they're animated and they're chattering. But whatever it is, like she's sort of feeding them or giving them some kind of energy. And the last thing that we saw was her saying, 
Lucero, you shouldn't have come here. Lucero, what do you do? Well, that answers some questions, at least. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if these were going out of her and into all the other things that are around here, or if it was just going off and siphoning to a unholy collection site. But she's a bit off the ground, right? Yeah, I'd say she's suspended maybe eight to ten feet up, maybe a little higher. Okay, I'm going to try and get up to a level closer to her so I can see what's fastening her, and, and I'll address her like as I'm trying to climb up or whatever if I'm able to do so. There's no immediate danger, so I think being able to maybe you know slide over some loose stones or something so you can get some uh, height and to take a look I think is perfectly fine. Give me a... I think this is going to be a discerned realities, but I would like to just know how you're doing it, like what this looks like on screen. Well, so it sounds like there's like a lot of things on the wall and it's probably at least a little bit segmented. So if I could, I would just try and scramble up the side of the wall and and kind of hold tight there near her so I can see what's fastening her. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And and I think what it is, is this sort of strange network of veins and tubes, they appear to be like holding her in place as well. They're like coming out of her, but also kind of pinning her. And they sort of spider web out all along the wall and along the ceiling and the side walls. And, and they kind of like get smaller and smaller, almost like a vein system, right? And these little like smaller veins seem to like go into these stone structures that have these bodies interred in them. Okay, I got you. Yeah, so I can climb. I'm going to try and climb that and get up close to her and see what, what all's going on here. Yeah, give me a discern realities just to see if, as I assume you're going to try to figure out like how to get her down, right? That's definitely, yeah, part of the inquiry. <laughs> Seven. All right, you get one question. Okay. What's about to happen as I'm holding the sharp end of my weapon near these, all these cords close to where she's bound to the, to the wall? If you gently stroke the edge of your blade against one of these, I think veins is the right way to put it, you'll hear an audible shudder come from one of the bodies deeper in the complex. Like you, it's like your blade grazes it and you hear this. <laughs> what do you do? So I think I'm pretty close to Urbina now and I'm just kind of like talk to her before I do anything more rash. Ooh. And what makes you say I shouldn't be here? I'm your brother. I need to get you free from here. You can tell that she is, the words that she spoke probably took a fair amount of effort. She seems to be going in and out. She's not entirely lucid. Um, her head is kind of lolled down. And she says, uh, Lucero, I'm in no danger. It has been this way for some weeks. And though I am weak, I... I know that I cannot die. Let them do whatever dark business they are doing. I, I am certain they will be done with me soon. And I grab her chin and tilt her head back and up towards me so I can see her, her, her mouth. You see fangs, if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> that's what I was wondering. Yes, she has turned. Mm. I sit here holding on to the veins coming out of my sister and contemplate the options that are before her and before me, I can cut her free from here and risk whatever danger that would bring and, and then take her out of this place and return her to the Castafiel crypts where I would have to bind her much to her misery. But there I know she would be safe for the day when we find the cure where I can leave her here and try and come back if we should ever find a cure and hope that she has either been destroyed by whatever magics are being employed or else she'll still be here and I can free her at that time. What do you do? I dig the blade into the veins and start to cut her out. The moment your blades begin to slice into the veins, there is a terrible wailing and screaming that rises up all over this chamber and echoes throughout. It is a cacophony of doom. 
Let's just end it there. Listeners, that's our show. We hope you enjoyed it. Discern Realities is a production of The Gauntlet. If you'd like to get in touch with us, just go to Twitter and tweet at us at Gauntlet RPG. We are on G+. Just go to the community section of G+, and search for The Gauntlet. You will find us there. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com, where we have launched a brand new blog. We have a cool new blog on gauntlet-rpg.com, where we are uh, discussing all kinds of cool topics and things. So go check that out. And we're on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. David, thanks so much. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, listeners. Take care.